of all the 12 cranial nerves with peripheral vestibular lesions. And that's actually what we, we have seen that cat before, but I didn't point that out. Head tilt to the left, the problem is left or right? The left, on the left hand side. And we have a nice diagnosis, the fast phase goes away from the left, away from the diseased side. So still on the left side. The question is now, is it central or peripheral vestibular disease? We have tested conscious proprioception. That's pretty good for a cat. Yeah, cats don't like me and I don't like them either. Let's see, we get to the face. Menace response. No real response on the affected side. So either she doesn't see the hand or she cannot close. Uh, she's responding there, but she's only closing the eyes and doesn't want to. Papyrus reflex. Now it becomes more obvious. She should be coming from the top, yeah, that's better. No eye closure, but on the right side it is. So she has patient nerve deficits on the affected side. Vestibular symptoms plus facial nerve deficits and no other cranial nerves. Peripheral vestibular disease. Yeah. Honor syndrome. I have been talking about the cranial nerves. The Horner syndrome is the loss of sympathetic innervation to the eye. It does not have to do anything with the cranial nerve. It's a different story. Horner syndrome. Let's maybe look at that image. Here's a typical image of a cat with Horner syndrome where the sympathetic innervation of the eye is lost. And the typical symptoms are the upper lid is hanging down, we call it ptosis. And as a response, the eye looks smaller than the other side, so that's the affected side. We cannot see the uh, smaller pupil because it's covered by the third eyelid. Third eyelid protrusion is one of the symptoms. And the eyeball looks sunken into the, the, the socket. So those are symptoms of a Horner syndrome, loss of sympathetic innervation to the eye. And here, the same applies as for the Facial nerve deficit. If you see vestibular symptoms plus Horner syndrome, it's peripheral vestibular disease. It's virtually impossible to see the combination of central vestibular disease and Horner syndrome. Um, so we have two combinations of nerves now. One of them is the cranial nerves, the other one is coming from the autonomic nervous system. If you see one of those or even those two in combination with vestibular deficit, deficits, then we are talking about a peripheral vestibular disease. And why is that the case with the Horner syndrome? The sympathetic nerves, uh, let's get one step back. This square here more or less reflects what we see here. We are looking into the middle ear. And I'm not sure if you can appreciate that those little lines here, those are fibers of the sympathetic nerve traveling to the eye. They are more or less laying on the wall of the middle ear. And if you have middle inner ear disease, they are easily affected by that problem as well. I, from time to time, I, I, I like to look into history. Um, for those of you who are bored by that, you, you can have a break for a moment, but um, Horner syndrome is named after Johann Friedrich Horner, 1868. But the knowledge about Horner syndrome is actually much older. It goes back to, and I don't speak French very well, but Francois Pofour de Petit, um, who actually was um, a doctor in the army um, of, I believe it was uh, Ludwig XIV. And times of war were very good times for medicine because doctors could study the insights the soldiers had and he actually did see a soldier that had a, a wound 
in the neck area and he recognized the Horner syndrome in the eye. He couldn't explain that, but he somehow knew that something happened in the neck causing changes in the eye. And interestingly, this Francois Pouffour de Petit did then studies in dogs transecting the sympathetic trunk and he could produce the Horner syndrome. But Horner did get the credit for all that, now, which is probably not fair. <laughs> now, I have said vestibular symptoms plus Horner syndrome means peripheral vestibular disease. And I was wondering if I put in that slide, I was afraid that I make it more complicated now, but I, I have to tell you the truth. The sympathetic innervation of the eye has a pretty long way to travel. It actually starts in the brain. It would be very easy if the information would go from here to the eye, but it does not. It actually travels in the spinal cord. It leaves the spinal cord in the lower cervical area, and then we have the vagus sympathetic trunk going along the neck, through the, uh, the middle ear, crossing the cranial cervical ganglion, going to the eye. So if I have a patient with a Horner syndrome, the lesion could be anywhere here. However, if I have a patient with vestibular symptoms plus Horner syndrome, I have to ask myself, where is the location where both connect? And actually here, it's in the middle ear. So what I try to say is don't believe that Horner syndrome does originate all the time from pathology in the middle ear, but in combination with vestibular disease, it's middle ear. That's the message. Paradoxical vestibular syndrome. It's getting, the further we get down here, it's getting a little bit more difficult. Paradoxical vestibular syndrome. If we see a paradoxical vestibular syndrome, and I will explain in a moment what it is, then it's, it's brain disease. So we do not see paradoxical vestibular syndrome with ear disease. Paradox. Paradox is something that does not fit together. And that's the same with a paradoxical vestibular, oh, sorry, vestibular disease. Usually, I had explained to you before that with a typical vestibular disease, all symptoms point to one side. I have a head tilt to one side, I circle to one side, so the same side, and if I have a horizontal nystagmus, the nystagmus is usually pointing to the other side because the fast phase is going away. So everything points to my right side. If I have a patient now who has exactly those symptoms, but it has reduced conscious proprioception on the other side, which does not which does not fit together, which is paradoxical. This patient has brain disease as a first. The second information is we know where in the brain, and that's coming in the next image, somewhere in the angle between pons and cerebellum. And the third information is that the majority of those patients have a neoplastic disease. So the message, if you see paradoxical vestibular disease, it's probably not good for the patient. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's here that angle where we expect the lesion, and we have a patient here, it's not exactly that lesion but um, in that area, but um, here we have something underneath the cerebellum which doesn't belong here, and this patient did have paradoxical vestibular disease. So now I have to look at my watch once. We actually made it through, actually I have that one more, yeah, one more here in that area. Um, I have a few slides to explain why paradoxical vestibular disease happens, but that might not really be necessary. Oh, don't, do you think so? Yep. I have a question. Like, I mean, <clears throat> if anyone comes in and it has got all the vestibular signs, head tail, that stagnus and circling, right? So, for timing, I don't know, is, is, uh, is the general vestibular disease or is the paradoxical? So, I mean, how can I, like, know, just from the neurological exam? Yeah, um, then I have to re uh, repeat it once more. 
if I have a discrepancy between my symptoms of head tilt, circling and nystagmus that point to one side, but my proprioception is lost on the opposite side. Yeah? Because otherwise all symptoms usually, even if I have proprioceptive deficits, it should be on the same side, except in paradoxical vestibular disease. It's more likely to be peripheral. It's not a black and white decision, but it's more commonly seen in peripheral vestibular disease. And we don't know why. It's usually unilateral. Towards the side of the on the side where the vestibular symptoms are. I guess we stop here, but I have still one question I left out. Do you remember when I showed you the cat with a bilateral vestibular disease? <coughs> and I asked you, this cat, is it more likely to have brain disease? Or is it more likely to have bilateral ear disease? <coughs> yes. It looks very similar to cerebral hypoplasia. It looks yeah. similar to cerebellar hypoplasia, which would make it a, a brain disease, yeah? I probably should exclude patients with congenital disease. Let's say she has developed that. Yeah. My point here is, if this cat has bilateral central disease, let's say bilateral brainstem disease where the vestibular nuclei is there, it would have to affect the left and the right side of the brainstem. All the tracks that travel through the mentation, all that should be affected as well. So if I have a patient with bilateral vestibular disease, but it's still walking around and not in a comatose state, it's more likely to be peripheral. Yeah. If this cat would be laying there, would be non-responsive to us, different picture. But a cat that is still walking around just cannot coordinate, it's probably bilateral vestibular disease. Yeah. Can I ask a question yes, about uh, brachycephalus, um, where we frequently find uh, on CTs um, fluid in both of the middle ears. Uh, how do you distinguish uh, where that is significant and, and when it is uh, not significant? Yeah, I'm not sure if everybody there um, heard the question in brachycephalic dogs. We commonly see an incidental finding of fluid filled middle ear, and is that significant? Um, as a neurologist, my response would be, if you do not have neurological deficits, then it's probably not significant. Um, and we see quite, quite a bit of those patients since one of, of the departments in our hospital has specialized on brachycephalic surgery. So I have the impression that we only see brachycephalic dogs and we see many of those. Um, having said that, we did a study once if that does affect the hearing of those dogs. Yes, it does. Uh, so, uh, when I said, do they have deficits, I was talking about our neurological examination, they really don't have, but they may have a reduced hearing. It's not lost, but they have a reduced hearing uh, on the side. Another option would be to um, take a sample of that fluid to see if that's inflammatory. And that can be done through the eardrum um, to see if there's an infection or not. Uh, but it's a difficult question. Um, the, the idea why that happens is, I mean, new method they have this term glue ear, and the idea is that the connection between the middle ear and um, um, the mouth through the Eustachian uh, tube doesn't function, so that's why the fluid accumulates there and it gets thicker and thicker and it cannot drain at all anymore. Um, I believe even in human medicine they say at some point in time this fluid that is stuck there may get infected. So the picture may even be more complicated. At any point in time, you can generate probably a middle ear infection from that fluid. So the fluid comes from the internal ear to the middle ear? No, it comes actually from, from the epithelium of the, of the middle ear. Okay. Now, it's constantly producing fluid, and normally it drains through the oestachian uh, tube, but because of the distortion of the skull, yeah. that mechanism does not work anymore. 
with the marine jobs? Do you have a, a like guidance for that? Uh, do you use a capita? Do you how do you do that? What techniques do you actually use? Yeah. Um, how do you puncture as a, as a eardrum? Um, before we had our own department for those things, it was often done by neurology, me. And I am answering the question from my point of view now because our department does it highly sophisticated now. So I take a normal um, otoscope and I take a um, syringe with a spinal needle because you need a long needle. And after visualization, I, I try to avoid um, um, the, um, the ossicles and just go through the um, uh, tympanic membrane, try to aspirate something. Sometimes the um, fluid inside is very thick and you may not get anything out. Then I take a little, little bit larger needle and sometimes I even put in maybe half a cc of fluid and try to aspirate it again to get a few cells and a little bit of material for bacterial culture. So it's wrong to go this way to the uh, that's, that's only in order to, uh, to, uh, to get a sample for analysis. Uh, what you are referring to is a surgical bulla osteotomy if you are convinced that it's a problem and you want to open up the, the bulla. Yeah. And then you have a lateral approach and you have a ventral approach. Is it, sorry, one more question. Is it going to the mind? I don't want to... But uh, if, if, the, if the owner is uh, thinking that their practice failing is dead, and you have CT findings of fluid, uh, do, is there any uh, data about whether removing that fluid actually restores hearing? Uh, otherwise, it seems to be a problem to advocate that. Yeah, um, we have done that study, but we have not published it because the results were inconsistent. Um, we did test it before and after, and in about half the patients, hearing, I mean, the hearing was not lost completely. The owner just reported this reduced. When we took hearing measurements, it was still there, and we could actually demonstrate that the hearing got better after the surgery. So I'm not talking about patients where the owner reports the animal is deaf, because that usually does not happen with middle ear disease. Middle ear disease reduces the hearing threshold, but it doesn't make you deaf. Um, and yeah, it does increase, but it does increase the hearing threshold in a level where I doubt that the owner will recognize that. Okay, then we go to the next talk, if you agree, yeah? You can breathe for a moment, and we will change the subject completely now. And we move to ah, uh, there it is. I thought I just forgot the presentation. Okay, it's spinal disease now, and it's not only spinal cord disease. I will be talking about in two presentations but it will be spinal disease. And as you can see, we will start with the most frequent spinal disease, which is intervertebral disc disease. And when I talk to veterinarians, I get the impression that it is common sense that there is this disc disease. It's one thing, disc disease. And the longer I deal with those patients, I believe we have to differentiate this work between those different types more and more. And if I have a patient that comes in for a suspected disc disease, they can look completely different. Um, here you can actually wonder if this dog is atactic, but it seems to be lame as well. And that can be part of the disc disease. It, it's not only that it may paralyze your patient, it can actually cause lameness as well. Um, we have seen this one, that's more the, what we expect, the more typical one, it's a typical dachshund, and this one is actually dragging his rear limbs, we already said, we cannot pre uh, say from the video if it is paraplegic or if it is just non-ambulatory paraparetic. Um, another dachshund. Um, So this is obviously still ambulatory. That's what we would call yeah, 
still ambulatory paraparesis. Why is it important? I said that before, because that reflects on the prognosis, um, to, to say how severe it is. But I have even, here, yeah, this, this dog is um, interesting in the sense that with intervertebral disc disease, the majority of them are painful. And I usually use that as a sign that we may be dealing with intervertebral disc disease. This dog does not appear to be painful at all. Yeah? But it has this disease. Yeah. My first thought actually was a different one. It was a chronic progressive rear limb problem. And I'm not sure if you're aware, you probably said it right now. Yeah, there is a chronic progressive degeneration of neurons, degenerative myelopathy. It's a very, it's a disease that is difficult to diagnose because there is a genetic test, but the genetic test is not very reliable. So it's more a diagnosis of exclusion. That's what I expected in this dog. And then it turned out to be intervertebral disc disease. Yeah. And we have one more example here that looks pretty boring. You are supposed to move, yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a happy dog. Basically, there is only one thing. Uh, I thought I highlight that. Yeah. <laughs> we are doing that intentionally. What we are doing right now, because what is the dog supposed to do after that? Shake. Could be good. Shake the head. Did you see what actually he tried? He tried. He did one movement and then he realized, oh, it hurts. Usually the shaking starts in the head area, then it goes through the entire body. This dog wants to shake it after the second movement, oh, it hurts. And what, it's, it's the only thing, I'm sorry, that was the only thing that was seen in this dog. And that could be intervertebral disc disease. And it's amazing that some of those patients actually have already significant spinal cord compression. And the only thing we see is, I don't really want to shake my head. And I actually advanced that technique to the point that nowadays I take a syringe and I drop a little bit of water into one ear. And that's a moment where a dog should shake. Yeah? They usually do if they're not painful. And if they don't, or if they start after one movement, they stop again. That would be an indication to have um, cervical pain at least. It does not mean necessarily that it's a disc extrusion, but that's then the most likely differential. Most of what we know nowadays about intervertebral disc disease in dogs goes back to this publication, which is already quite old. Hans Jürgen Hansen from uh, Denmark actually wrote that. Um, and I mean, nowadays we believe we have invented medicine. No. Uh, it's amazing what actually people with quite different opportunities did already develop much earlier than in the last 10 years. And uh, just to put it into a perspective, 1952, I'm not sure if you know that, that movie, High Noon, yeah? that's when that black and white movie was made. At the same time, Mr. Hansen actually laid down the foundation of intervertebral disc disease of dogs, or quite a while ago. Now, actually, there was a year again when Elvis uh, Presley sang his first songs as a, as a student still, and uh, that's when he died. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hansen differentiated between two types of intervertebral disc disease, uh, and he called it obviously type 1 and type 2. In type 1, everything starts with degeneration of the disc, early degeneration of the disc, in chondrodystrophic dogs. And chondrodystrophic does not mean anything else than disc degeneration. And the disc degeneration is obvious on histopathology with a half a year, maybe one year of age. At that age, we already can see that the discs are degenerated. It's a young dog, it's merely a puppy, but discs are degenerated. 
And following that, this degeneration, at some point, we may get a rupture of the annulus, and the nucleus extrudes and compresses the spinal cord. It's usually a relatively acute problem. That's what he called type 1 intervertebral disc disease. Which breeds are chondrodystrophic? I have listed a few of them here, and most of them are actually dogs with a long back and short limbs. I come back to that in a moment. But there are other chondrodystrophic breeds that look completely different. Yeah? So those dogs do not have a long back. And in my opinion, it's not the long back that is a problem. It's the disc degeneration, the early disc degeneration. And I have used that, that image here. If you take a dachshund, which really has a long back and which is predisposed to intervertebral disc disease, if you give that dog longer limbs, it looks like a normal dog. But the back hasn't changed at all. Yeah? So just the fact that he has that short limbs, how is that supposed to affect the spine? Yeah? So I, I have some doubts about the idea that the long back is a problem. Um, I believe it's a disc degeneration, and then some minor insult is enough in order to rupture the ligament and to extrude the disc. Now, if you take plain x-rays, you can see certain changes that indicate that this dog may have intervertebral disc disease, and one of them is a narrowed intervertebral disc space. You can imagine if the disc is extruded, it's not there anymore, then the vertebral bodies get closer to each other. It's only a minor change. I'm not sure if anybody can actually identify a narrowed intervertebral disc space. T13L1? Uh, T13L1. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's uh, 11. So I believe we are talking. 11, 12, yeah. Mm, yes, in order to determine where, where we are, that's probably the last rib here. Then it's probably 12, 13. Could be that there's still a small rib here. And we are talking about this one. Yeah. Yeah. Above the, the, the vertebra. Above the vertebra. There's L1. Ah, here's the L1. Yeah. Obviously, I didn't know what I'm doing then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So don't don't send the patient to me. Does that mean necessarily that there is a disc, disc extrusion? No. It means there can be opacity in the intervertebral foramen. Sometimes, if the mineralized, degenerated material extrudes, you may see that in the intervertebral foramen. So the foramen should be as black as here, but there is some material that could be this extrude. And sometimes we see something we call wedge-shaped intervertebral disc space. What does that mean? That means that not the entire disc space is narrowed. It's that the proximal part is narrowed. So it's not getting that close, it's just the proximal part, because the disc material is just missing on the proximal part. And I believe you, that might be slightly to be appreciated here, that's narrower than here. However, all those signs I have explained to you only lead you to the statement this dog could have intervertebral disc disease. And that's probably something you already knew before. You took those x-rays because the dog cannot walk anymore. So you already knew one of your differentials is intervertebral disc disease. Now you took x-rays and you still have the differential of intervertebral disc disease. Why do I explain it that way? Because I believe if you have a patient with intervertebral disc disease, taking x-rays, taking plain x-rays, does not add any information. So if your indication is intervertebral disc disease, taking x-rays does not bring you any further. If you want to make a diagnosis, then you have to take x-rays after you injected subarachnoid contrast, or you have to do a CT or an MRI. But plain x-rays in a dog with suspected intervertebral disc disease is wasted money. Maybe you could look at that at a different point from 
point of view, if you own the practice, that is probably not wasted money, you earn money, but from the medical point of view, there is no reason to take those images. The picture changes if you say, okay, there could be a fracture or a luxation. Okay. The picture changes if you say there could be a spinal tumor, if it is affecting bone, yes. But intervertebral disc disease, in my opinion, is not an indication to take brain injuries. I think it's a contraindication. I'll go further. It delays treatment. It is a contraindication. Yeah, I could, um, I could support that statement. I'm a neurologist, so my sentence are usually not as strong. Um, but you, yeah, I, I can see your point. Yeah. But if, if you do myelography, uh, you shall do first normal x-ray. Okay, no, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> if you decide to do a myelography, then under the, during the pro procedure of doing the myelography, we take plain x-rays in order to be able to compare the post-injection images to the pre-injection image. Yeah. Okay, that was type 1 intervertebral disc disease. Now we have type 2, according to Mr. Hansen. It is the same in the sense that all this starts with this degeneration. Not exactly in the same way as in type 1, but we don't have to care about the type of degeneration. The disc degenerates. But the problem, the neurological problem, happens in older dogs. It takes more time. It's not an early age degeneration. It takes more time. Um, who is affected? Everybody who is not shown to So everybody else, everybody you did not see on the list before. The statements I made now are a little bit black and white, and you can already guess that the reality is a little bit more gray. <laughs> but we have to use those generalizations, otherwise I could not say anything at all here. Um, what happens? In this case, you see that the annulus is still intact. At no point this annulus ruptures, it stays intact, but it weakens. And it slowly extends further and further and further against the spinal cord. And that's why it's a chronic progressive process. Type 1, acute. Type 2, chronic progressive in the second half of the life of non chondrodystrophic dogs. How does that look like? Here we have a transverse MR images of the lumbar spine of the dog. That black area here uh, is actually a T2 weighted image. Um, no, it's actually T1 weighted. Um, that's a disc, the black area. The spinal cord here is the half moon you can see here. And this thing underneath, that's the weakened annulus that produces against the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is only the half on top of it. Um, that's the spinal cord. Yeah. And interestingly, it's severely compressed, but since it's a chronic progressive problem, those dogs are usually still walking. If that would happen acutely in a type 1 dog, it would be paralyzed. Yeah. But since the spinal cord had time to adjust to the pressure, they are still walking around. But, but, uh, why? It's a uh, cerebrospinal fluid is uh, bright. No, actually I believe that's epidural fat here around. That's here. So, um, the CSF should be here right mm -hmm. in this black area. Mm -hmm. I believe that's that compress and that's uh, epidural fat. You're right by mistake, Tito. Upper corner, yeah. upper left. You already recognize that uh, Thomas does not label his images correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hansen differentiated between type 1 and type 2. Nowadays, we recognize more types of intervertebral disc disease, and I usually tend to call them type 3 and type 4. Some people say no. It's not legal. Mr. Hansen started that system and he only he was only aware of two types and there's no reason that we are allowed now to call it three or four. So it depends. If you follow my arguments, it doesn't matter. You just have to be aware that there are more types than type one and type two. I call it type three or 
Other people call it NP, and I will call it, I'll tell you in a moment what NP means. What happens here? In contrast to type 1 and type 2, this starts from a normal disk. Here we had said disk degeneration. That starts with a normal disk. And in a normal disk, the nucleus pulposus is fluid-like. It's relatively soft, it's a little bit like a fluid. And what happens in those dogs is that a teeny tiny, tiny rupture in the annulus is enough that this fluid, which is under pressure, that does suddenly extrude. So the fluid comes out in a second and it hits the spinal cord. It's just the hit, the contusion that is causing the symptoms. Since it's fluid, it's not compressing the spinal cord. In the first two types, we had spinal cord compression. In type 3, that is a contusion. Oh, it's only fluid, but it really has power. In this moment, it hits the spinal cord and it's causing damage inside the spinal cord. Guess how we will not treat those patients? Surgery. Compressive, decompressive surgery, because there is nothing to decompress. Yeah? Um, that's something we have to recognize, um, because there is no, no need to do surgery. Who is affected by type 3? non dystrophic dogs. Why does that affect non dystrophic dogs? Non yeah, <laughs> the nucleus is degenerated in chondrodystrophic dog at ver very early age. There is no fluid anymore that can extrude. Yeah. So the dachshund, the French bulldog, they usually don't get type 3 intervertebral disc disease because they have degenerated disc. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's protecting them. Yeah. NP, what does NP stand for? Acute, non-compressive nucleus, Pulposus extrusion. It's a long word. Type 3 or NP. How does that look like on images? In this, in this case, it's actually T2. Yeah? How do I know that that is a T2 rated image of the spine? Here we have the spinal cord. Here is cerebrospinal fluid and there is fat around. It's difficult to say here, but if you look at that, those white areas, that's a fluid fill nucleus pulposus. And since it's fluid, it's white as C2. Yeah? So sometimes it's easier to look at the disc as long as they are not degenerated. Once they are degenerated, they lose their fluid and it doesn't work anymore. Um, and I hope that you can appreciate that there is a little bit white here on top of that disc. Here inside the spinal cord, there is some edema. Mm -hmm. If we cut through and take a transverse image, we have that. For comparison, I have a normal image here. Uh, it's T2 weighted, the dark round dot in the middle is a spinal cord, then the first white ring is a cerebrospinal fluid, and the other white ring is fat. Fat is white in nearly every image. Here we have the spinal cord, and inside the spinal cord we have that white area. That's edema inside the spinal cord caused by type 3 intervertebral disc disease. The only way you can diagnose that is by MRI. Does that mean necessary that so you need an MRI in all cases with type 3 intervertebral disc disease? No. Because if you take a myelography and if you do not find any spinal cord compression, in an acutely paralyzed dog of non chondrodystrophic breeds, it's probably type 3 in the disc disease. Or another differential we have to talk about. But you have to make a decision, does that dog need surgery? And if you do not see any compression, it does not need surgery. No? Type 3. I even talk about type 4. Again, Mr. Hansen is not aware of that. No? Um, and for those who don't like type 4, again, we have an abbreviation, HNPI, and I will tell you in a moment again what that means. Um, some people call that a disc cyst. Again, non-chondrodystrophic breeds. Interestingly, in this case, 
the spinal cord is compressed by a very soft part of the nucleus pulposus. It's only like gelatin-like fluid, but it's still compressing the spinal cord. It's causing acute symptoms. Um, HNPE, hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion. For those of you who say, oh, I, I will never have an MRI, it might be a little be difficult to follow that now, but I, I guess we should be aware that there are different types and different things we can do with those patients. But I will try to explain. It's about that area here. Here we have the spinal cord that has to go over that hill and underneath the spinal cord there is something localized and it's white in a T2 weighted image. It's fluid. But this fluid cannot distribute, it's just caught there. And what I believe what happens there, nobody knows for sure, but because if you do a surgery, you destroy everything. In order to find exactly out what's going on, you would have to take a dog, euthanize it, and do pathology on it. But we don't do, we want to treat them. What I believe what happens there, I'm not sure how it is here. Um, in Germany, we sometimes on the streets, we have those artists that have air balloons, and they make little figures out of it. You know what I'm talking about? Little dogs and things like that, and they twist it, and suddenly a little bud is coming up. And I believe something similar happens here. There is still a little membrane around that fluid that prevents it from distributing, even though it's only fluid. But since there's still a membrane around, it's compressing the spinal cord. The fluid cannot disappear. Um, and that's what I believe happens in NP. As I said, some people call it discal cyst. And here we have the transverse view that is going through here. The dark thing is a spinal cord, the white thing is, a, let's call it a discal cyst. It's T2, white, so it's fluid. So we have seen a similar image before, this one here. What is the difference between here and here? Again, the spinal cord is like a half moon, and something is sitting underneath and compressing it. Same here. But here, it's not fluid. It's degenerated disc. In this image, since it's white, it's gel-like, fluid-like intervertebral disc. So different types, type two, type four. Is this in this case like a, a coat or? Yeah, it's percute. Now, to make it a little bit more systematic, uh, to summarize it, we have types of this disease that start with a degeneration, and we have other types of this disease that originate from a healthy disc. Um, type 1 and type 2, the ones Mr. Hansen described, start with this degeneration. And type, you yeah, don't have an image here, but type 3 and type 4 start with a healthy disc. So, it can happen in any dog, uh, more or less at any age, except the shoulder dystrophic ones. Uh, as long as the disc is relatively healthy. Um, this one here, type 2, does cause chronic symptoms. Whereas all the other three types cause acute symptoms. So if you have a dog with really chronic symptoms, it's less likely to be type 1, 3, or 4. It's more likely to be type 2. Uh, why is that important? There are different arguments, but one argument is if I have a chronic, chronically compressed spinal cord, surgery is much more dangerous. You have a spinal cord that had tried to compensate for chronic compression for months, and now we come with a surgery, and we may cause a little bit, a little tiny bit of additional insert to the spinal cord, and that could be the difference between a walking dog and a dog that is not walking after the surgery anymore. So the risk of making the patient worse during the surgery or after the surgery is much worse in type 2 than in the other ones. Now, that would be one argument why it's important to know. Now, here we were talking about degenerated versus non-degenerated. We can look at those four types in the sense of which are compressive and which are non-compressive. Um, Non-compressive is only type 3. The one where the spinal cord is hit by fluid, you get a contusion, you get a edema, whereas 
The other three types, type 1, 2, and 4, are compressive, and they probably benefit from surgery, whereas this type, we already said there's no sense to perform surgery. So that's why I believe it's a little bit important to be aware of those differences. It's not this one type of this disease that does exist, what most of us have in our mind if they see the paralyzed patient. There are different types that does affect, that, that do affect different breeds, that show up at different age, that are treated different. I have, I have told you that type four, the one where the fluid is compressing the spinal cord, is compressive, and we usually do surgery on those. Uh, I don't want to hide from you this relatively recent paper, I believe two years ago, written somewhere. They compared type 4 with surgery and with conservative treatment. So you have that severe spinal cord compression and that paper came to the conclusion that it does not make a difference in outcome if you do surgery or not. I'm not sure if that would be my spinal cord if I would like to wait. But maybe I have to change my opinion. Maybe this fluid is absorbed and the compression resorbs by its own. I don't know yet. We still do a surgery on those dogs. But maybe in three, four, or five years from now on, I have to make a different statement. But actually, it is not fluid. It is like jelly. It, it's and, jelly. Uh, yes, yeah. and it might be mineralized uh, in future. Might be, but this study somehow indicates that something else may happen. Now, we, we don't know why mm -hmm. there is no difference. Somebody could say they are bad neurosurgeons. That's why they don't have a difference between surgical outcome and conservative outcome, but uh, that's certainly not true. Uh, so something else is going on there. What is a message for everybody else here is that if you have a suspicion of type 4 intervertebral disc disease, <coughs> The patient is completely paralyzed, but the owner does not have the money or does not want to do a surgery. It's probably an option to wait. Yeah. And you have even an argument to say why. MRI. Yeah, but even if you see, I mean, you don't have a diagnosis. Yeah, exactly. You do the MRI. Don't just do the plain x rays. Push for the MRI. Yeah, push for the MRI. But even then, if they say, no, I don't want surgery, I would not utilize the patient right away. With this study, I probably would wait if they don't want to go for surgery. I still recommend surgery in those cases, but um, if they don't want to, um, we can wait. If they don't have money for surgery, do you think they have money for MRI? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, I'm not sure how it is here, we have patients who want to have a diagnosis. It's not a matter of money. But if it comes to surgery, and I'm obligated to talk about risks of surgery and things like that, then they don't want to go further. They want the Yeah, yeah. Or they are not sure about the prognosis, about the findings of it. Yeah, that's, I mean, we can, whenever we do a surgery, we can never promise that everything will go well. We'll talk about the prognosis in a moment. But, so, there was one question before. Yeah, like uh, you were saying that uh, in the first looking of practice, if you have to reach to the diagnosis like, of type 1 and type 2, it would be disease, you should uh, exclude the type 1 and type 2. So if it's not, it doesn't exist there, it means it's type 3. So my question is how we can reach the diagnosis of type 4 if you have to reach disease in the first looking of practice? Um, okay. 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 That would be easy. Like, mm -hmm. if you really be having conjugate stroke pain and non conjugate stroke pain. That would be a very easy thing. But they can have type 3 as well. Sorry? Type 3 can be the non conjugate stroke as well. So, I mean, your question was how do I differentiate in, in, in general practice type 4 from, yeah. from type 1 and type 2? Um, from type 1, I believe you can differentiate just based on the, on the breed that is affected. Uh, from type 2, you can differentiate that type 2 is a chronic progressive problem and type 4 is a very acute problem. Right. So that, that happens suddenly, per acute even. Now, so is it 100%? No. no. Yeah. But you get pretty close to the correct diagnosis by using just the progression and the breed and the age. Just recently I operated uh, 11 years old dog 
Labrador with a type 1 massive uh, extrusion. I have another question here. Yeah, so I'm still confused about type 3. How can this do it? Come and hit the spinal cord and damages, mm -hmm. and we know that there is no the door matter outside the knee then. Um, actually, it, 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 it primarily hits the dura mater, but the pressure is transmitted into the spinal cord. And I'm not sure how it is here, but if you use um, a water, what is the term, hose, hose, yeah, hose. and yeah. if you really put your finger on it, there's only water coming out, but you can really generate pain if you point it at a person. It's just water, but it's under pressure. And that's exactly what happens. It's a teeny tiny rupture only. And the fluid is under pressure and hits the spinal cord with power, even though there's dura mater between, but it's enough to cause a severe contusion. And the spinal it is. cord itself is not the strongest pressure. No, but his argument was there is the dura mater protecting the spinal cord, but the pressure is actually transmitted mm -hmm. through the dura mater to the spinal cord. Yeah. Can I talk about the, the concepts which you just raised there? One was uh, about the certainty of diagnosis. And then the other one was about the certainty of outcome. And I think these are two important concepts that are different. They approach the same problem from different angles. With the certainty of, uh, of, of diagnosis, it's, it's got to be to do something like an MRI or to do a, a myelogram, a CT myelogram or something like that. But for the certainty of outcome, it's more about whether the owner has this particular outcome in mind. If they want to recover function, then it directs us towards a certain uh, course of action or their participation in a certain course of action. Because I don't think we're saying that type one is going to do equally well surgical versus conservative. There's a clear distinction between those two, um, the, the functional outcome in those two, yeah, that situation. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I, I will come to the uh, prognosis to the outcome um, just by using that image again, that, that's really a central mm -hmm. image for neurology. That the severity of a spinal cord lesion to a certain degree predicts your outcome. Um, and there are variations depending on the underlying pathology, but as a general rule, the further you go down those stairs, the poorer your prognosis gets. And that's why it's really important to at least to recognize patients with loss of knee pain. And why is that actually? Why does that go down depending on the severity? And that has a neuroanatomical reason. If you look at the transaction of the spinal cord here, we have different types of nerve fibers that are responsible for different functions here. And as a general rule, we can say the larger the diameter of a fiber is, the more susceptible it is to any type of trauma. The second rule, the more myelin the fibers have, the more susceptible they are to any type of trauma. And the, the third rule is, the more superficially they are located, the more susceptible they are to any type of trauma, at least coming from outside. And if you look at those fibers here, those large ones here, in the periphery, those are the fibers being responsible for the proprioception. And that's why that is one of the first things that is lost if anything comes from outside. On the other side of the scale, very well protected in the inner part here, teeny tiny fibers, barely any myelin sheath, those are responsible for deep pain sensation. And that's why deep pain sensation is usually the last thing that is lost if you have a if you have lost your deep pain sensation, something has hurt the spinal cord inside. So, yeah? There's a dynamical aspect to this as well that, that isn't sort of carried by this sort of slide, which is that when the first opinion vets see the cases, those cases may look worse the next day. And that adds a lot of stress, I think, onto the owner, onto the first opinion veterinarians. Um, that isn't really quite conveyed like this. That you get a dog that's three steps down on day one, uh, first veterinarian sees it, tells the owner to come back the next day. The next day down, it's verging between paresis and plegia, and everyone gets more and more anxious. It's like this, it's not a... Yeah, it can actually even be the opposite way. The next day it can be better, and then the decision becomes more difficult what to do. 
Yeah. So it's only to assess the moment when you see the patient, but you have to be aware that it can be different even two hours later. Yeah? It can progress very fast or it can become better. But still, what I want to highlight is that at your presentation, it's important to determine where are you on that scale in order to determine how fast do you have to respond, uh, do I have to respond at all, does it make any sense to do anything at all, or should we talk about euthanasia? Um, and that's why I believe it's very important that all of us understand the same when we talk about deep pain sensations. So I already said before, if I pinch the patient, I want to see any mental response that it hurts. It's not about flexing the limb. And here I have one example of a dog that has a normal flexor reflex and for many clinicians, even for clinicians, it appears like being deep pain positive just because there is a normal flexor reflex. However, this patient has lost deep pain sensation. So it's a, it's a dog with paraplegia. Only those may lose deep pain, as long as there is voluntary motor movement, there is no need to test that, but there is no movement at all. Obviously, it's very scared as well. Or it's not used to, to walk on its own, it's supposed to be carried around. And now we test deep pain sensation, you will see there is a flexor reflex. Yeah? But the animal does not feel anything. And it's really mixed up. Very often people say, I pinch on the limb, and yeah, it's flexing the limb, it's feeling it. It's a flexor reflex. And that reflex, as we said before, when we talked about neurolocalization, this reflex is coming from that area. So if I take a rusty knife and cut through the spinal cord in that area, you will still have a flexor reflex, but no deep pensation. Why a rusty knife? <laughs> because it sounds more dramatic. <laughs> Going back to your cascade yeah. of um, symptoms there, at what stage do you recommend, this was your dog, when would you operate? If an owner asks me if it would be your dog, I usually say I don't an answer that question because it's different for me. I'm a neurosurgeon. Same. I have to do surgery on every dog, uh, especially my own. But that's not really an answer to you. Um, can I? Um, I will respond to your question in a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. I think that's exactly the point. It depends on the goals of the particular person that's involved. Yeah. Your goal is probably excellent. My goal would be excellent. Restoration of function. That really yeah. drives your decision. And I, I will come back to those ex expectations. Huh? Um, in a patient with loss of deep pain sensation, euthanasia is an option all the time. Do we have to euthanize those? No. no. Uh, depending on the underlying pathology, if there is a fracture or luxation, I would say, if a fracture or luxation is causing loss of deep pain sensation, euthanasia. If if this intervertebral euthanasia is not a reversible not condition. Sorry? Uh, euthanasia is not a reversible condition. Yeah, but uh, uh, there are certain conditions where the owner expects some recommendation from your side. And from time to time, we have to say the prognosis is so grave that we recommend it. And that would be a case with spinal fracture luxation that has lost deep pain. And there have been studies done. People have tried to do surgery on those. If you lose deep pain because of a spinal fracture luxation, you usually do not recover anymore. You get your spine stable again, yeah. yeah. The prognosis will be the same even though if I do the surgery the first 12 hours or same year, um, The question is uh, if, uh, if deep pain sensation has been lost longer than 24 hours in intervertebral disc disease, if the recommendation would be the same. A few years ago, yes. And I did recommend euthanasia to several clients where the deep pain sensation was lost for 48 hours because I was trained that way. And then there have been some new studies that actually re reported that that cutoff is probably not appropriate, that patients that have lost their deep pain sensation for longer times may even recover with a percentage of 50-60%. 
So that has changed in the last years. You know? But all of those I would have come to a little bit later. Um, so I want to show you um, another, actually here, here I have written it down, yeah? if it is intervertebral disc disease. Um, but I would like to show you another case we have seen before to make sure that everybody understands the same when we talk about deep pain sensation. That's the Fox Terrier, uh, I believe, that comes now. Yeah. The one that we already know now has peripheral uh, disc disease. Now I test, I really pinch him. This dog cannot flex his limb, but as we will see once more in a second, deep pain is positive. Yeah, so those are different stories, and I really want to highlight that if you leave that room, that everybody is on the same track, what loss of deep pain sensation means. It's not about flexing the limb or not. It does not have anything to do with that. It's the question, do we have any mental response? Does the patient yell, scream, turn around, bite? Anything that indicates I have recognized somebody is applying pain to me. Yeah? Treatment. I will avoid the acupuncture. Will we get any positive effect on these type of cases by using the acupuncture? Um, <laughs> my, my English is... Um, <laughs> Not acupuncture. not only yours, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> did, did you ask for acupuncture? Yeah. Um, I don't have any experience with acupuncture myself, and I somehow am reluctant to talk about things I have not experienced myself. I know that there are studies that have reported some success, yeah, but I really would not like to comment on this. Not because I don't believe it, but I don't want to talk to you about knowledge I have from textbooks or from papers only. Yeah. I believe those are the, the, the major options and what, what I've written down here, that's just our approach. There is no common sense among neurologists. What are indications for conservative treatment? That's the way we handle it in our hospital. If we have only mild neurological deficits, um, mild gait changes, mild ataxia, um, reduced, not lost, but reduced proprioception, and if conservative treatment has not been tried yet, it comes in acutely, then conservative treatment, I will tell you what I understand under conservative treatment, would be an option. Um, financial limitations, as long as a patient, I'm talking about intervertebral disc disease now, yeah? as long as a patient has deep pain sensation, I would say conservative treatment is an option if there is no money for surgery. In my opinion, if they do not want or can go for surgery and deep pain sensation has been lost, I usually recommend euthanasia. So that's our approach. On the other hand, indication for surgery is every dog with type 1 disease who cannot walk on his own anymore. Even though there is voluntary motor function, if it is non-ambulatory, we usually, and we do it then the same day, uh, go to surgery. Severe type 2 intervertebral disc disease, even though the dog is still walking, because usually they have significant spinal cord compression. However, we have to discuss with the owner that there is an increased risk of surgery. You know? um, severe spinal pain, pain we cannot control with medication. We do not want to tell the owner of that painful patient, take him or her home and watch her for the next week if it is severe pain. That does not go over very well. In the afternoon, they get a second opinion from another vet if you do that. Yeah? So severe pain. Or conservative treatment failed. If that, if that here did not result in any improvement, we obviously have to go for surgery. Yeah? And then we still have euthanasia as an option. Loss of deep pain sensation. Um, Probably time does not play a major role anymore. We do not know for sure, but as I said, it has changed. Probably even if you have lost deep pain sensation for two days, maybe even for three days, you still have a 50 to 60 percent chance of recovery. As I told you, I have instructed the owner differently a few years ago. That's something we learned in the last years. 
What is um, conservative treatment, in my opinion, physiotherapy, and the rest? Um, I, my, my experience is that telling the owner, keep your patient quiet, does not really help because what does that mean? Yeah. And I usually say, you or I, we would be in a bed. That may not be true, but that's the way I explain it here on. So you have to do something that comes close to bed rest. And I usually, it doesn't mean that your dog has to be in your bed, but using, using a, um, a crate, crate the right, for, uh, for children where you can put your dog in. That does not help if the dog does not want to stay inside and try to get out. So if they are really active inside, it's obviously not helpful, but that's something I recommend. Avoid extreme load on the spine, definitely. No going, not going stairs, no jumping on the sofa, no jumping into the bed. That's probably the most difficult part for the owner. Um, that is a, a study, but not, not the correct term, from a newspaper that belongs in a category where actually nobody is admitting that he or she is reading it, but nevertheless, they did uh, a questionnaire for their readers, and it came out that 75% of German dogs are allowed to jump on the sofa. Yeah. And now I tell the owner, your dog is not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. That's very difficult because that's part of the social interaction. Um, the way I explain that usually is that in a dog where we try conservative treatment, if your dog jumps down from the sofa one time, that could cost you 3,000 euro. No? And that sometimes helps. <laughs> no? mm -hmm. uh, medication. There was a time where people recommended high dose prednisolone or even dexamethasone therapy based on a study, I believe there is an image uh, coming um, in, in a second. Nowadays, we actually do not recommend that anymore. Either you do not use any prednisolone at all, or at the very most, a low dose FIS instructed here. So it does not mean non steroidal plus, it means or. So we do not recommend to combine those because of the gastrointestinal side effects, giving that for about one week. And the justification for still using a low dose of prednisolone is probably that paper from 2013. They did actually look at intervertebral disc material they have removed during surgery. And those little black dots here, those are inflammatory cells. So there is obviously some inflammation that we might be able to suppress with anti-inflammatory drugs, um, but we do not recommend the high dose anymore. That's a paper where the high dose recommendation came from from 1984 in cats, a study that was really done, um, those, those are, were not clinical patients, it was a study where they did an, an injury to the spinal cord of cats, and then in a very tight time frame, they investigated the effect of methotrednisolone sodium succinate, and they got a little bit better outcome. In the meantime, many large-scale studies have been performed in human medicine and in veterinary medicine, and the conclusion is actually that this is even contraindicated. So I'm not sure if you are using still high doses. Um, there's common sense in human and veterinary neurology that it should not be done in spinal trauma patients anymore. And other drugs have been tried. Um, that's just, just one example. Obviously, nothing does really influence, uh, no drug does really influence the outcome of intervertebral disc disease, at least not of those that can be used um, nowadays. If you talk about surgery, there are different types of surgery available, and I have listed those here, and you can see a little bit where we remove bone. All of them are options most people perform hemilaminectomies. Um, and if you look at that image, that's um, an, R, an MR image, here's the spinal cord, and that black dot is the intervertebral disc extrusion, and it's sitting on the side. So if I remove one side here, as in a hemilaminectomy, you can easily see that I get access to that area. 
or if I do a mini hemilaminectomy. So for lateralized this disease, a hemilaminectomy or mini hemilaminectomy is a pretty good option. And now uh, that's actually this extrude. Um, for many years, hemilaminectomy was actually the surgery done. And going back into history again, it all started, interestingly, the Scandinavian people were obviously quite active. And it started with this fenestration, so not really removing the compression, but just removing part of the non-extruded disc. And it obviously helped some patients. And then in 51, hemilaminectomy was introduced. Um, a few years later, dorsal laminectomy. And again, those numbers usually don't tell us a lot as, until we look at histories that happened during that time. So hemilaminectomy is a very old surgery. Uh, the dorsal laminectomy, the one I have mentioned here by Funquist, you just remove the top of it. And if you have disc material sitting on the side and on the bottom, I'm not sure if that really helps. Some people did compare that with a picture. If you have a flooding in your basement and you remove the roof of your house, it probably doesn't help you at all with the flooding in the basement. So, but it's a surgery that can sometimes be used. Um, then mini hemilaminectomy appeared at the same time when the first Rocky movie came up. And then since 1976, nothing really changed in spinal surgery. So for a long time, we did do the same surgeries for all patients. Um, and the question is, or was, isn't there anything that can be done better? Just because our grandfathers did it doesn't mean that we have to do it as well. And this paper here actually was an highlight for me in 2012. It was a study done in dogs with type 1 intervertebral disc disease, chondrodystrophic dogs. They did hemilaminectomy, and at the end of the surgery, they asked the, no, they asked the surgeon to judge the decompression. And actually, it, it was different. They said the surgeon is supposed to do the surgery until they feel they have decompressed the spinal cord completely. That was a goal. And then they closed it up, and they did imaging after that. And the question is, when the surgeon was happy and said, I decompressed the spinal cord, how many patients did still have residual spinal cord compression? What do you think? I would say about 20%. I do CT of the mind. Yeah. One in five, maybe. I'm it's, it's really in interesting to do those images later in this study. It was 100%. 100% of dogs where the surgeon said, okay, I am happy with the surgery, I have decompressed the spinal cord, there was remaining spinal cord compression. Now, we should not ignore that sentence here, or no, actually it's saying somewhere else. The residual disc material that was there did not seem to influence the outcome. I'm not sure if I buy that completely, but I believe we can do better than a residual compression of 45% of the spinal cord diameter. And I believe there are different reasons why that happens. And one challenge is really type 2 intervertebral disc disease, chronic, progressive. So not the chondrodystrophic dogs, I believe we can do relatively well, but the chronically compressed spinal cord, I've shown you that image before. Here's the spinal cord, here we have the type 2 intervertebral disc disease, that's the way it's supposed to look like. Do we actually know what those two round black dots are here underneath the spinal cord? Those are not additional spinal cords. Blood vessels. There are two large sinuses, blood vessels that can be quite disturbing during surgery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Understatement of the year. <laughs> now, for many years, uh, let's switch over there. For many years, type 2 intervertebral disc disease, and I have highlighted that with a color now, that's this, that is this extrusion. For many years, those were treated by hemilaminectomy as well. Again, hemilaminectomy, we remove that part. But now the disc is sitting underneath the spinal cord. In order to reach that, we have to lift up the spinal cord, compress it additionally, in order to get them with this material out. And believe me, if you are the spinal cord and you are compressed, you do not want to be compressed more than it already is. 
So that was was a real challenge for surgeries for a long time. And then a little bit more recently, especially for those cases, another surgery was introduced, which we call partial lateral corpectomy. Corpectomy, ectomy, we remove something, and corp, we remove part of the vertebral body. So we cut out a piece here to get underneath the spinal cord that may become more obvious here. That's a hemilaminectomy, dorsolateral approach. That's a lateral approach, remove the part of the vertebral body, and then you can pull this material out without compressing the spinal cord additionally. Why do I tell you those details? Um, the answer to that question comes in a few minutes. So here we have a real patient. Before surgery, that's what we try to drill away. That's after surgery, and we have a nice round-shaped spinal cord here. Looks great, looks perfect. However, that surgery is quite a challenge. Hemilaminectomy yeah. um, comes from the top. There isn't no, there's nothing really in your way where destroying it has significant consequences. Getting here, there's some round structure underneath. If you put in retractors here that open up that space, so you have to go here to the spinal cord, that round thing is a kidney. kidney yeah. There's a kidney. If you are further in the thoracic spine, there is a chest underneath. You can easily cause a pneumosorus. Um, remember what I said, what those, let's say here, what those round dots were on the floor of the camera. Vertebral venous sinuses, you can easily drill into those sinuses. That bleeds dramatically. So that is a challenging surgery. Um, and that should be done by somebody who has done surgeries for quite a while. But, in my opinion, that's the solution for type 2 intervertebral disc disease. Much, much better than anything else. And we have some measurements how large that opening can be for those who are interested, because if you make it too large, the vertebral body may fracture and everything breaks down. Um, can that be done at different spaces? Yeah, we have a dog here. That's before surgery, a CT myogram, uh, that white ring is the spinal cord. Here underneath, we have the type 2 intervertebral disc disease, and here is the same, the spinal cord is barely visible on the top, and there, there's a disc protrusion, and that's after surgery. It's a nearly round-shaped spinal cord again. Yeah. Um, here another dog, miniature schnauzer, 11 years, Progressive real paresis two months, and the myogram already shows one, two, three, maybe even one more. If you look at the CT image before surgery, here a half moon, here a half moon, half moon, here as well. All of them are significantly compressed by type 2 diverticular disc disease. That's after surgery, yeah, without much manipulation of the spinal cord. and. To end that, I mean, this dog, I would probably, before the times of corpectomy, I would have euthanized that dog. There's no way that you get a significant decompression of the spinal cord by hemilaminectomies. But by introducing that new type of surgery, that dog did not become normal, but it obviously is, is a happy dog. Yeah? So, Type 2 intervertebral disc disease, partial lateral corpectomy, challenging surgery, but better option than hemilaminectomy. Okay, I guess we stop here because it's time for coffee again. Yeah? And we start the next round, maybe with questions regarding this talk. Thanks. That refers to intervertebral disc disease now. As long as there is voluntary motor movement, we probably have a 95% chance that this goal can be achieved. Um, even if we lose the voluntary motor movement, but we still have intact deep pain sensation, the prognosis is only slightly worse. Maybe it's even more around 1995, but I try to be conservative with my estimates. So as long as we have deep pain sensation, the patient probably has a pretty fair chance of reaching that goal. And then it becomes somehow a little bit more nebulous um, what happens if deep pain sensation is lost. As I said before, um, many years ago we said 
no deep pain for more than 24 hours, there's a chance of recovering ambulation of about 5% that has been changed. So probably at least the time frame has to be changed or maybe the time frame is not as important at all anymore. But the probability of being ambulatory again is dropping. So it's certainly not the same as in that area with deep pain sensation. And that's something we really communicate to the owner before we make a decision about, or the owner makes a decision about surgery or not. Okay, so much about intervertebral disc disease. Are there any questions up to that point? Oh, wait, I do have a question. I, I think this is the part that is old. I, I think this information, I remember when I went to university, I don't know how many years, 25 years ago. Um, and I, I think we should be aiming higher. I think that we're offering uh, clients uh, very expensive surgery, and I think we should select more aggressively on our cases. And I think we should be offering, uh, telling the clients that we are aiming to restore the dog back to the function as before. I think this neurology, maybe we slipped a little bit. Uh, orthopedics has gone ahead of us in the neurology. We have to sharpen our game a little bit. Um, and I'm not sure if I agree that orthopedic surgery is ahead of us, uh, because if I take as an example cruciate ligament rupture, um, they do a lot of fancy surgeries without really proving that the outcome is better than what has been done 10 years ago. Um, I can agree that we should aim for more, but I believe that's the reality right now where we are. Um, if, if we agree that our goal is to restore function to normal, I think that the connotations of that is we should know, have some data about whether operating uh, quickly uh, within 24, 48 hours is actually justifiable because that to me still remains you, your preference, I presume, my preference. I prefer not to have a dog that has had steroids before. Preferred not to have a dog that has been for one week with some uh, neurological problems and then coming to me. Um, so uh, we don't have the data though. Why, why don't we have that data? Why don't we have the data? I, I can only talk for Germany. I believe we don't have the data because the studies that would have to be conducted in order to get those answers are usually not approved by ethical committees because you would have to wait a certain time with a blinded population of patients and do a surgery two days later to see if that makes an outcome because comparing natural disease of different degrees is probably not reliable and we don't, just don't get that studies done. I know that the University of California actually tried to conduct a study to compare surgery against not, not performing a surgery in type 1 intervertebral disc disease by making a sham surgery uh, so as good as the study can be done, and it, it was approved. So it's very difficult to get those data. Yeah. So conceptually, um, would you agree that uh, our, our concepts that we can agree on is that uh, there's an inflammatory process after a disc rupture, there's a compression which affects the blood supply to that area, and we, we know that the longer that stays, we get demyelination. Are these uncontroversial concepts? Yeah, that's... That's probably, no, maybe with exception of the last point, we don't know if for the long term we get demyelination really. We do not know how long the blood flow is um, um, uh, reduced uh, because there are no studies.